Today I'm looking at another Dark Pictures Anthology game, The Devil in Me, developed by Supermassive Games and released in 2022. I'm a huge fan of these Supermassive Games and was really excited to realize the game actually dropped. I forgot about it, and here it is. This was released for the Xbox One, the Series X, PlayStation 4 and 5, and also PC. I'm playing this version on the Xbox One. So the Dark Picture Anthology series is a bunch of games where you're fundamentally playing a horror movie. It's the closest thing to a cinematic experience with a game that I can recall, and the games in general tend to be pretty lengthy, and they're definitely not standard horror movie length. And usually it's you trying to make it to the end of the game with as many people alive as possible. There are usually many different endings to these stories, which is great for the replay value. Like most games I play on modern systems, I first ran into the most common frustration with these games that I have. I needed a 30 gigabyte download in order to play it. Oh, I hate that so much. I'm going to be really curious to know what happens 5 or 10 years from now when these companies shut down their servers. This is the fourth game in the Dark Pictures series, and this is the last game in what is called Season 1. Season 2 is out later this year, I think, or at least starting later this year. And currently there are a total of eight games projected for the whole series. I love these games, so I really hope it goes on beyond the current limit. So far, each game in the series is generally orchestrated in almost the same fashion, at least in terms of the actual handling or the way narratives generally progress. And there's also a use of a narrator throughout the whole game. These things are pretty standard game to game, and overall they work for me. But of course, each disc has a totally new cast of characters and a totally different story to follow. Vastly different. They're going to happen in different times, different places, they have totally different characters, and the supernatural backbone to each setting is going to be different, which is something I love. Now, when I play these games, I kind of think I'm controlling an episode of, like, a Tales from the Crypt or the Night Gallery. I guess, insert whatever horror anthology franchise you want. It's kind of like that. This is the world that these games exist, and it's always going to be around some sort of a supernatural horror element. And if you're liking that sort of thing, and you're looking for something that's a little more cinematic than a standard video game experience, this one is kind of made with you in mind. Generally, I don't consider these to be traditional action-packed experiences. They're not. They're really much more like a slow boil. There's going to be a lot of exploration, there's going to be plenty of reading, and lots of time to take in all the little details. And there are usually tons of little details running through these. The graphics are beautiful, and in a way it kind of seems to make these horror elements feel even a little more horrific. I know back in the PlayStation 1 era, if I was playing like a Resident Evil, yeah, it's scary, but it would have been twice as scary if those graphics were of a really high quality. And that's what we have here. This particular story starts out before the turn of the 20th century, and there's a newly married couple checking into their hotel for their honeymoon. This is the introduction scene, and it's how all these games usually set up the rest of the narrative. Something is going to happen to someone, and, well, this is a horror game, so you know it's going to be bad. It's going to take 15 to 20 minutes, probably, and it's going to set the stage for what's to come. After this intro, we're talking turn of the century, we do get an introduction video, and this is where we meet our narrator. He's going to pop up throughout the game in between the different chapters to let us know how we're doing, or maybe help push us along. The main characters are a film crew trying to film a documentary on a prolific serial killer from the turn of the century, H.H. H. Holmes. He was basically a criminal that created a hotel that was designed to trap and kill people. Very interesting. Never heard of him before this. I guess he's sometimes referred to as the first American serial killer. Anyway, this film crew receives a call from a wealthy recluse that offers the group access to a mansion. The mansion was designed as a recreation of the H.H. H. Holmes Hotel. They have a documentary series that is kind of struggling, and they wanted to take advantage of the opportunity to visit the hotel and film an episode as quick as they could. So a car picks them up right away and drives them to a boat, and they're taken to this manor that's on an island. Of course, someplace isolated. There are plenty of cliché horror movie elements in this one. We're talking stupid things that happen to people where they don't react like you'd expect. Or at least not what I would expect. Like, 
everyone receiving an order to leave all their phones in the car. Like, anyone would follow that order? I don't see it. Or maybe the first character we meet is rushing around, kind of acting weird, not letting them even ask questions about what's going on. I mean, we're talking any questions. Don't ask me any questions until we get there. Really? It, not talking to you for an entire boat ride when there's absolutely nothing else around to distract anybody. We can't talk to you. It's weird. It's quirky. Uh, I guess they wove it into the story anyway, but just little moments like that. Little weird oddities. I think these moments are minor overall, but they do sort of stand out a little bit to me sometimes, and even though they match with standard horror movie tropes, I don't know, I guess it's not too off target, but I would prefer them to be a little different sometimes. Like, the flashlights barely offer any light. Really? Modern flashlights, even cheap ones you pick up at a gas station, they are crazy efficient and they have tons of light. You don't get any of that here. It's like you've got a, a flashlight that's barely working. I get a little frustrated with that. And the cameras. The cameras are fixed, so you're going to have to fight with them at all times. It's going to be tough to see certain angles or certain rooms easily. I'm even okay with that, I suppose. Just for some reason, the flashlights, I got, I got hung up on a little bit. There are plenty of walk-around moments. Actually, most of this is a walk-around moment, and it's just you examining the scene. And then, then you have these specific horror moments. Those times are handled a little different. The place you have the most physical control are when you're just walking around doing nothing exciting, really, but, but sort of researching. You can turn around, you can interact with things, all that sort of stuff. But when these horror moments happen, that sort of suspense, it just becomes a movie. And it's something that you probably have to interact with at one point just by pressing a button. So, if you were running away from somebody, there was something, you know, really scary happening. You're not in control of running. You're just sitting there watching the movie until the narrative offers you an option. And just be ready to press whatever that button is as quick as you can. All these interactions are timed and they happen really quick sometimes. I imagine the first time you go through this game, it might be a little harder, just because you don't know where these presses are going to be expected. We have a handful of different endings here. Two major paths, apparently, and then there's a bunch of different combinations, I guess, depending on how many people you manage to get to survive till the end. There's a co-op mode available as well, but I haven't tried that. I'm not part of the console subscription services through these consoles. I have way too many games in my backlog to want to sign up to something like that, so I'm going to have to test the co-op stuff some other day. Overall, this game really met my expectations, and after I beat it, you unlock this mode where you can select a specific chapter to start from again. I beat it again, and got a different combination of an ending. It, it might not seem to have as many endings as the last supermassive game that they released, uh, which would be like The Quarry. The Quarry had a crazy amount of endings, but I'm kind of satisfied with what I'm seeing here. We get some really good jump scares, we get a pretty menacing villain, I guess, with a cool and unique look. And in a way, it feels like they kind of crossed maybe a Michael Myers from the Halloween franchise with aspects of the Saw series or the Collector series, if you're familiar with that. I didn't really go to this one expecting a really unique horror experience, nothing really new. But it was certainly different enough, and there were enough interesting details in the story to keep me engaged the whole way through. I really like that. I do feel like the narrator portion of the game for this one felt a little less used than some of the other games I played. Maybe it was just the path that I chose to use, but I kind of figured he'd pop up a little bit more frequently. Well, that's all I have today for the horror game, The Devil in Me, for the Xbox One. I'm really looking forward to the next one they have in the series. I think it's going to be in outer space. Thanks for stopping by to take a look at this, and hope to catch you on another video.